Episode number three of the 2019 off season of the Bears Talk Underground is brought to you by my bookie. Guys, the NCAA tournament starts today with the play-in games, and it is truly one of the biggest betting events of the year. Whether you like filling out a bracket, picking out a national champion, picking first-round upsets, or all of the above, my bookie is the perfect home for March Madness fun. Will Williamson and Duke uh, cement their legacy and win a title? Can Virginia get over being the number one seed that lost to a 16 seed last season? And can Kentucky get back to the Final Four? If you know the answers, or even if you don't, my bookie is the best place to get in on the action. They have something for everyone, everyone, even you, multiple bracket guy. My bookie has been in business for years, and their goal is to give you the best customer service in the business. And the best part is, they pay out fast when you win. I'm talking in like 48 hours. Bet with the best and kick back and enjoy March Madness while the picks, while you watch picks, cash in. Deposit with my bookie today with promo code Bears twenty five for a 50% sign-up bonus. That's promo code BEARS25. My bookie, you play, you win, you get paid. And uh, this episode, guys, I'm, I'm so excited about it. Uh, it's, it's crazy how I got myself here. It's, it's, a, it's a crazy twist and turn, all starting with me buying the USFL book uh, or in the fall. And, and, and <laughs> I bought the book um, on Amazon. I, I reached out to to Jeff Perlman to take him up on the offer for some free USFL swag that he was giving away. And when I sent him the email to confirm that I bought the book, I'm like, hey, how would you like to be on my show? And he agreed for some reason. He agreed to be on the show. You guys heard that interview. That went awesome. And when I received the book and I, and I started to read it, I noticed on the back there was a blurb from Kyle Brandt of the NFL Network uh, telling us what a great book it is, what a great read it is, and so on and so forth. So I figured... Well, if he's uh, if he knows Kyle enough well enough to get a blurb uh, for his book, then maybe I could ask him if he could hook us up. So I did. I reached out to Jeff Perlman and I asked him, you know, would it be possible to get me in touch with Kyle Brand? I'd love to have him on the show. He went uh, to Kyle and Kyle agreed to have him uh, give him for him to give me his contact info. I reached out to Kyle Brandt and the rest that they say, as they say, uh, is history. And uh, what you're going to hear in a, in a moment or two is the result of, uh, of that conversation. Uh, I spoke to Kyle Brandt this morning. Uh, it was an amazing time. Kyle's such a fun guy. And uh, it, it's no wonder that he's, uh, he's a highlight of one of the best uh, sports talk shows on, in the country. Uh, he's a co-host of, of Good Morning Football uh, on the NFL Network. He's been running strong for about two and a half years now, going on three. And... Um, you know, it's it's it was a pleasure talking to him. He is a Chicago area guy. He is a Bears fan. That's why I asked him uh, to be on the show. And uh, we just had a great conversation. I hope you guys enjoy it and uh, stick around afterwards. And uh, we'll do a little bear talk uh, at the end. So but without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I grant to you the powerful and attractive Kyle Brandt. All right, so here we are. Uh, I've been uh, very excited about this. I was teasing. I had a big guest coming up on the show, and and thanks to Jeff Perlman, of all people on this planet, I have Kyle Brandt on the Bears Talk Underground. Kyle, welcome to the show, sir. Barry, I'm thrilled to be here, although I will admit I'm a little bit nervous. I, I don't know if I've ever spoken to someone, let alone on a podcast, who's been to 17 KISS concerts. So well, a little nervous. <laughs> Somebody's been doing their research. The kind uh, of guy who goes to kiss 17 times in this era, well into the 21st century, it must be really committed, a little bit nuts, but I'm here, man. And, and tell me, how did it come to be that many times at the kiss concert? Well, you know, uh, thanks for starting the interview by interviewing me. That's great. Um, That's my oldest trick in the book, dude. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> no, it's, uh, I blame my dad. Dad grew up a, uh, you know, a kiss fan and it just kind of, one of those things when I was a kid, you worship everything that your dad worships, kiss, football, you know, all that stuff. And I just, it never shook me. I could never get uh, rid of it. And if you're talking about 17 being a scary number, 
how about twice in the last uh, what twelve days or something like twice. that? Twice in twelve, you yeah. just can't get enough of it. You love saw... that Detroit Rock City. You 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 live for it. What is? It? I've never been to a Kiss show. I feel oh. pretty certain, although I'm open minded to it. I feel pretty certain I will not be seeing Kiss in concert in my life. <laughs> but what am I missing? Uh, it's the best show on on earth, man. It really is. Come on. I mean, they they, they everything that you would imagine. You know, the music is fun. You got the costumes, the lights, the explosions. Uh, everything, man. It's uh, it's a part the best of it. show Absolutely. on earth. See here, I Absolutely. thought that was Matt Nagy's offense. Hey, well, you know what? It, it, it's a close second. I will, I will, uh, I will concede that. But it's uh, it's it's not I quite it, number dude. one. Not quite. I love it. One. I respect it. <laughs> but yeah, I saw him uh, on March second in Chicago, and then eight days later in the uh, Quad Cities, right on the Mississippi River. Here in the, the Iowa Illinois border. So well, listen. I hope this goes so well that we can somehow springboard you to getting Gene Simmons on the Bears Talk Underground podcast because that's that's what this has to lead to. That would be somehow uh, unplausible that for that to happen, but uh, you know, a, a girl can dream. So sure, um, I, you know, I like Kiss and everything. I just wish that they had taken the uh, the marketing side of their career a little bit more seriously. There, know, there were right? certainly dollars to be made if they could have merchandised their name or their logo, put it on a lunchbox, a thermos, anything. I would think they really left some money out there with that. Yeah. It was all about the music with them. Huge missed opportunity on that. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not oh, like, all uh, right. You didn't think we'd yeah. be talking Kiss to start, though, Larry. No, but I'm I did not. That was actually, there's, that's nowhere anywhere in my notes, Kyle. But uh, you Let's know, we'll, do it. We'll, what we'll, do you got in your notes? Then light well, those notes on fire. Just talk to me about what you want. Well, whatever first you want. question that I had yeah. was, um, I got the idea to 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 reach out to you when I had Jeff Perlman on the show because yeah. I, I I took a shot. And asked him if he would like to talk about his book on my show, his awesome USFL sure. book. And I saw that Kyle Brandt of the NFL Network gave a nice little blurb on the back of the book. And I was like, hey, you know Kyle Brandt. You think mm -hmm. you can get the two of us together. How do you know Jeff? Oh, man. Perlman, first of all, anybody listening who doesn't know Jeff Perlman, you're missing out. Go and type his name into Amazon. And some of the books he's written are incredible. He's this New York Times bestselling author who um, wrote amazing books about the, the Dallas Cowboys back in the day. Um, he, he's written, written very controversial books about Walter Payton, if you're listening to Chicago. Yeah. He's the guy who wrote the crazy John Rocker piece of Atlanta Braves where he said all those bigoted things. Like Perlman's been all over the place. Um, and he's an incredible, entertaining personality. So uh, I go back with him. I met him. Uh, when I was working for Jim Rome in California on one of his talk shows, at either on ESPN or CBS Sports Network, and Perlman would come on as one of the panelists. I remember one of the first things I learned about him, you think he's just going to be all sports all the time. Perlman is a huge fan of Blind Melon. I think Blind Melon, Larry, is his kiss. He saw them, okay. whatever it was, 17 times before they broke up, and I think the singer died. But uh, So I thought that was just so odd that, that they had the No Rain song with the B-girl dancing and everything back in the 90s, but he still lives and dies with Blind Melon. So I like weirdness like that. As you can probably tell by the way this podcast started, so I always like sure. Perlman. All right. So – Speaking of, you know, I, I, I was looking up my, my Kyle Brandt facts on Wikipedia yesterday. I don't oh, know how let's accurate. get into it. Yeah. Um, what, what I loved was when I actually went to your Twitter uh, feed uh, the other day, I was looking at your bio, and one of the lines in there is, my resume is weirder than yours. So then I immediately yep. went to Wikipedia, and um, it's hard to dispute that fact, uh, <laughs> Kyle, because the, just the, you know, because I know that you came to the NFL Network from the Jim Rome show, yeah. Um, but how we got from Kyle Branch, Chicago area guy, to Jim Rome is beyond strange? my comprehension. Uh, <laughs> because first you go from Stevenson High School, a high school I'm familiar with. I went to Evanston. Um, oh, okay. So, the Wildcats. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. I got gotcha. you. So, so I have some familiarity with the area. A good friend of mine actually went to Stevenson, but I think he was a little bit older uh, than you. His name was Ryan Katz. He's actually working for WWE out in the uh, no in, in Orlando. Yeah. What's he doing? Uh, body slamming people? He's a producer. He works behind the scenes for them. Oh so, my gosh. Yeah. That's that, a cool uh, job. All right. So his yeah. resume is pretty cool. Yeah. yeah the but thing I'm with not... the resume is like, I, there's, there's many, many, many people who have a better resume than me <laughs> and probably some that have a worse, but I just have not yet to find someone who's this weirder. So you're right. starting to go through it and it's just, it's, I haven't even left Lincolnshire yet and it's already starting to get weird. Right. Well, you go from from Lincolnshire at Stevenson High School. You, you you work your way to Princeton. So kudos to that. And then from Princeton with an English degree, 
we go to the real world in Chicago. Yeah. And you're not using that as a phrase, like it's it, like the, you enter the real world because you graduated college. The actual program called the yes. real world, you know, with with Puck and uh, Stephen and Irene and uh, Ruthie. Yeah, that one. I was in that world. It was not yeah. So, are you still certified to be a lifeguard, or did that <laughs> did that end when you the know, show ended? <laughs> I think that's probably expired. I hope it. I hope it would be. That was 18 years ago. I was a lifeguard on North Avenue Beach, right there in Chicago, in uh, June and July of 2001, and uh, it was wild. I, I worked there when the air show was going on, and these, you know, F-16s would buzz the beach. And I remember my memories of that for people in Chicago who know that beach or that area at all. I remember it, our job was to be a lifeguard, but in the swimming area that particular summer, maybe always. You really, there's, you really can't go in the water like above your waist. So there wasn't a lot of action for guarding lives when, <laughs> the, as far as you were allowed to go, was like into the upper thigh area. So it was just a lot of sitting around and uh, just getting my life traumatized on MTV, which was a hoot. Right, and working on your tan, that kind of thing. Yeah. What else was I supposed to do? Right. So then, of course, the natural progression from the real world in Chicago on MTV is to go out to L.A. to be an actor. And this is where things took a huge left turn uh, for me because you went from from Princeton and your English degree. You go to the real world, which isn't that crazy. You're a young guy. You want to be on TV. You go to the the real world. You 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 beat out fifty thousand people to get that job. But then you become Philip Kyriakis on Days of Our Lives from two thousand three to two thousand six. How the hell did that happen? <laughs> That's an appropriate question. And uh, listen, I don't even know if it was that normal for me to go on the real world after Princeton. Everybody I was rooming with and all my teammates were uh, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, blah, blah, right. blah, blah, blah. And I just I knew I wasn't going to do that. And then MTV came to campus in the spring of my senior year when I had almost nothing to do and no job. I uh, got pretty loaded with some friends and I and went to it and they seemed to like me and ended up in my hometown of Chicago go out to LA, like Beverly Hillbilly style, got an apartment uh, right in Hollywood, not far from the Hollywood sign, right up the street from where the Oscars are. And um, for like the next year was just sort of young 23 year old wide eyed dude in LA. And finally I got a job. <laughs> I got a job on days of our lives. And I signed a three and a half, three year contract. It was extended in six more months at the end, but a three year contract that I just turned, I think I just turned 24, 23. And every day then I was doing there with John and Marlena and Bo and Hope and Amnesia that and Evil Twin this. And it was an unbelievably cool time. It was kind of like my graduate school. Some people, you know, going to Wharton School of Business or Kellogg or whatever. I went to the uh, Days of Our Lives postgraduate work uh, society and it was nuts. I had a great time. Yeah, because the, the Wikipedia description of your character's storyline includes saving his girlfriend from mercenaries, being yep. tortured as a POW, Losing his leg at war and eventually becoming a NASCAR driver. That was my favorite. Isn't that uh, incredible? So like, that really did happen. And uh, um, Casey Mears, the NASCAR driver, came on did like a walk-on role. In the, and I just remember them, they were thinking, well, it seems to be there's a lot of crossover between the soap opera fan base, maybe in you know the southern part of the, of the country, and the NASCAR fan base. So what if we had one of those little diagrams where they cross over in the middle and we'll have – Philip would be a NASCAR driver. And I said, that's great, but I only have one leg. One leg, and yeah. I, without knowing all the tenets of NASCAR, I do think you need two legs. So but they said, nah, you know, there can be a prosthesis that you can work the clutch with. I said, I don't think that, well, too bad you're doing it. So uh, my one-legged character became a NASCAR driver, uh, I guess because all the ballerina jobs were taken, but that's what happened. Oh, true, my true. God. And that that's when what... I get into saying my resume is worse than yours. Right. Yes. Well, because then we make the leap from Days of Our Lives to Jim Rome. How did we bridge that gap? Okay. So um, I woke up one morning. I I had been off the soap opera for about a year. I was unemployed, almost out of money, miserable, depressed. I say I woke up one morning, but knowing my lifestyle, then it was probably like one fifteen in the afternoon. I sure. get up. I've got my robe on. I walk over to my BlackBerry Curve that's plugged into the wall, and I see I have an email <laughs> from Jim Rome. And I was like, what is, is this some sort of Prince of Nigeria nonsense spam thing? Right. No, sure enough. I had a blog at the time. It was a very cool thing to have a, a blog in, in 2007. It was very cutting edge. And I would just write nonsense on it, whatever I was doing in LA. 
And a friend of mine who had played college football with Ross Tucker, who was now in the media and at the time was getting into it, uh, was making some waves. And Jim Rome contacted Ross and said, you want to come join my team or talk about it? Ross said, I can't move to California, but there's this guy out there. His background's a little different, but you should look into him. Sure enough, Rome really did contact me. I met him shortly thereafter, after a pretty long hiring process. I got the job, and then nine years I, I wrote, I wrote yeah. and produced for Jim Rome. Right, and then from there you make the natural progression from, you know, radio and then later on TV to the NFL Network and and uh, Good Morning Football, and uh, that show's taken off, man. It's uh, widely regarded as the best football show on TV. Oh, dude, thank you very much. From your lips to God's ear, Larry, I love it. You should need to put that out on a tweet, and we'll put it out there in our next promo. It's a good show. It's fun. Um, it's absolutely nuts how it came together because – the four hosts, none of us really knew each other very well at all when we got the job. I had never met Nate Burleson before. I'd never met Kay Adams before. We were already under contract to come in and do it. And I moved my entire family, including our 19-day-old baby from wow. Los Angeles to New York. And we showed up at JFK, lost, crying, tons of luggage. I felt like we were on Ellis Island. And uh, if the show had fallen on its face, I think my uh, personal life would have as well. So two and a half years later, we're still doing it. And uh, people seem to like it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, every, every, I'm not much of a morning person. I'm that guy that will wake up, hit the alarm and 30 minutes later, I'm out the door uh, to work. So, cause I was sleep until the very last moment and then I'm getting oh, ready really? and, and heading out. So I never really get a chance to watch the show uh, in the morning, but anytime that I have had that opportunity, I've really, really enjoyed what you guys uh, are doing. And um, you get up in the morning, you, you blast some Dr. Love and you, you put on good morning football and that just gets you going. That's that's it. You know, actually, I prefer the live version of Black Diamond, but oh, Dr. look Love at is, you is a is a nice substitute that will work. But uh, <laughs> you know, so it's 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 been you know I, I was going through your your Twitter feed uh, yesterday to try to see if we grab on to a thing or two to talk because you're such a boring guy, Kyle. I mean, we really hey, had dude, to dig I'm deep, doing the best uh, I this. can. Let me tell you, you know? about the raising kids and uh, the traffic <laughs> I hit on the way in the city today. No, what, I, whatever you got, I, I'll, I'll I'll help you out. Well, you you had something yesterday, which was perfect for for our conversation today, called Confession Monday, where you you admitted to the world you've never seen Step Brothers. Never seen it. Never seen, never it. seen it. It came up organically. Uh, Burleson was comparing uh, some sort of dynamic in the NFL to the movie Step Brothers, and I was nodding my head and pretending I was getting his jokes and his references. And I just, as we usually do on the show, I just said, Nate, I'm just gonna love it with you, man. I'd never even seen that movie. And I'm, you know, the, my character on the show, if you can call it that, is I've seen pretty much all the movies. I know the pop culture right. pretty well. But it comes down to this, Larry. Everybody, everybody, no matter how much you may be plugged into your Netflix or your old DVD collection and your case logic or whatever, everybody has a movie they just missed. And yeah. no one has seen everything. There's a movie that people know in society that you have not seen. You, me, everybody. And that just happens to be one of mine. People took it on Twitter that I was anti-Step Brothers, that I'm not interested in seeing it. Not the case at all. I'm not one of those people who are out there right now. There's a there's this growing army of people who, oh, I've never seen Game of Thrones, and I can't wait to tell you how cool I am because I've never watched it. And then I'm going to tell you that I'm a vegan and uh, I'm a cord cutter <laughs> and all these amazing things about me. It's not like that. Right. I just miss Step Brothers. I, I got no excuse. I'd love to see it. I'm sure it's great. But it, um, I got so much heat for not seeing it and so many threats that now I almost want to not see it on principle. I may never see it. Okay. Well, I'm going to do you a favor and save you, you 90 minutes. Don't okay, see. so Larry, you don't like it. I no, no, I am, I am a, I, am, I am in the anti Step Brothers uh, category. I'm a, what I'm is a it huge about it? Will, people, th people think it's incredible. I, you know, I'm a huge Will Ferrell fan, but the guy is so hit or miss with me because of what they do. It, very little of what you see on screen is on the actual page. They're making mm. it up. You know, they're doing what they're best, and it's so hit or miss. Like Anchorman, masterpiece, genius movie. You know, love that movie, but. When I saw Step Brothers, I was very excited to see, you know, O'Reilly and, and, uh, and Will Ferrell. When I saw that movie, yeah. I was like, this is just nonsense. And they're like, and I know people like my sister thinks that that God's crafted that movie. She loves it to the end. People love it. I can't stand it. I think it's and the I most don't know. Here's the thing. Like, there's some movies that if you haven't seen them. The following of it and the social media presence of it and the, you know, the gift collection or whatnot, A, it sort of makes you feel like you already have seen it. And B, it's also like a little off-putting. Like there's people out there, for example, 
who maybe haven't seen The Big Lebowski, which you know I've seen and I love like most people, but they right. just they've heard so many of the damn lines and so many of the references and the dude this and the dude that, they're probably like, I don't even want to watch that anymore. I'm so sick of hearing people talk about it because there's people quoting movies, especially ones you haven't seen, can be really annoying. So <laughs> I'm almost there with Step Brothers, but uh, it, I feel like I have seen the entire movie from start to finish just by gifts on Twitter. Well, you know, I, I have a movie like that that I have never seen that people would, and especially for me. Oh, yeah, what's, I'm the yours? Guy, what's yours? What do you got? I, mine, mine is Goonies. I've never seen the Goonies. I mean, I'm not offended by that. I've seen the Goonies many times. I enjoyed yeah. it. I enjoyed it as a kid. I enjoy it now. But you tell people that they have you've not seen one of their favorite movies, and it's like you threw a drink in their face. They react yes. as if they directed that movie. So Goonies, I, I'm sure you know, hey, you guys, and one-eyed will. You probably know a bunch of the references, Truffle Shuffle, because you've, you've heard them, right? Right. Sure. So Absolutely. your life's not going to change if you see the damn Goonies, Larry. It's okay. That's excusable. It's fine. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm not going to be that guy who says, what? You haven't seen Goonies? Or what do you mean you've never seen a Zoolander? I hate that guy. It, it's so inc- – yeah. I, I don't know. Maybe when I was, should have been watching Zoolander, I was out on a date or I was with my children. I was reading a book. Are you really <laughs> going to judge me? The stupid uh, Ben Stiller model movie? It's, it's, yeah, I'm not going to judge you for not seeing Goonies, Larry. It's fine. Well, I appreciate that, Kyle. I, I, I will be Come able on. to sleep again tonight. That's fantastic. And so yeah. one other thing I wanted to talk about, one of my favorite clips was a a rant, if you will, about how yep. Disney is killing parents uh, in their, in oh their my movie. God. How basically every child is parentless in, in, a, in a Disney movie from Bambi to The Lion King to Cat, or Finding Nemo, you name it. There are parents missing in just about every Disney film. All right. I'm glad you brought that up because – I, I've, I have two kids now. One's five, one's two, and it's an amazing thing that I go through every day. You think, you think you turn to Disney. That's a brand you can trust. It goes back decades and decades. Walt Disney, this incredible visionary, this amazing American, and you turn on some of these products. And you think, I can just put my kid in front of it, or we can go out to the movie theater, and everything's just going to be fine. And there is so much BS shoved into these movies, and most of it has to do with killing off these parents. It's like, for the for the company that is so founded on creativity and, and magic, there's neither in these movies. You take a kid, you have one of his parents, or both of his parents, either be dead to start the movie, or die as the movie begins, and then that is your crutch as a stupid plotline of character development. I turned on that Finding Nemo, because I, I hadn't seen it in years and years and years. In the first two minutes, yeah. Nemo's mom is basically murdered by a barracuda, it, right in front of you. Then you turn on, all right, well, let's try Frozen. I got a, I got a little daughter who likes this. Oh, you turn on Frozen. There's great music. It's a wonderful family, two daughters. This should be a good movie. Bam! Both parents killed at sea in the first act of the movie. Uh, Belle's mother, both of Aladdin's parents. It goes on and on and on. Ariel's mother. I don't know why they can't just take a parent, take a kid, give him a couple of nice parents, and have him get into an adventure. Because they say yeah. when you wish upon a star, you, all I wish upon a star is that I could have one normal storyline where I don't have to shield my kid's eyes when the mom gets killed. You know what I'm saying? You're getting me started up. But I don't understand it at all. And it, I'm constantly protecting my kids. We fast forward through scenes in these movies. We turn them on. You think you can watch Finding Dory or whatever the hell it may be, Little Mermaid? No. There's always stuff you don't want them to see. And I just wish once we get through it without that. Did you did you know about the 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 connection or the story about uh, the the parents in Frozen? Yeah, they became Tarzan's parents or some BS like that. Yeah. You know what happens to Tarzan's parents? They're eaten alive uh, by yes, a jaguar <laughs> in the first act of the movie. Now think about that. Not that they die in a car accident or they get a disease. An animal eats them alive, probably slowly, as their baby is nearby. I mean, that is sick. Sick stuff, and you, they bring in the Phil Collins soundtrack. It's supposed to all go down easy. It doesn't. It's yeah, fine when you're a is... kid, when you're a teenager, when you show it to your kids, and the Jaguars eating Tarzan's parents. It's pretty messed up. And this is after they were marooned on, on an island after they were shipwrecked, leaving Elsa and the other one behind on on Frozen Land. Or, or yeah, can't or whatever, they send so... word to Elsa <laughs> and, and and Anna somehow? Is there a letter, a message in a bottle, or a raven, or something they could send back yeah. to Arendelle to be like, kids? We're not dead, at least not yet, because we're about to be eaten alive. It's just it's it's so so morbid, and it shouldn't be. Right, because it's Disney for Christ's sake. 
come on, who are we supposed to trust if not all Walt Disney? Yes, and and, yeah, and I say that, and I just I just have a direct conduit from my checking account into the Disney uh, Empire. I just constantly am paying them money for everything to raise my children, and yet I still sit here and complain about it. Right, all right. So, so um, so I, when the other thing on your uh, Twitter bio that I was really interested in was that you said, and I quote, "I can destroy you at Tech Mobile." Now I have two yeah. questions about this. Yeah. Um, a, which Tech Mobile, and mm -hmm. B. Which team? Okay, that's the great questions. I'm classically trained. I'm a purist. And while I do enjoy and celebrate all the subsequent Tech Mobiles that came out over the years, yeah. I really only prefer to play the original 8 bit Nintendo Tech Mobile with four plays in the playbook. Mm -hmm. That's the one I like. I understand Tecmo Super Bowl and everything took off. I like those games too. But it's like, you know, someone sits down on a piano and they'll only play a, you know, a Yamaha or they'll only play a Les Paul guitar. I will only play. If, especially in competition mode, the four play tech mobile. And to answer your second question, I would, I'm, a, I'm really a two team guy with occasionally um, going with a third. Uh, Raiders are my team. Everyone was Bo. You do sure. Bo, you do a little Marcus, Marcus Allen, you do Todd Christensen, a little Bill Pickle and Howie Long on defense. But I did really also like the Bears, right? Obviously because of sweetness, but they would get uh, Dennis Gentry on the kick return, and I was a big cap bozo over the middle guy and the tight end. Right. So a lot of bears, and then every once in a while I'd be the Giants just because they made Lawrence Taylor completely unstoppable. So uh, fifty, I'd say 50% Raiders, 40% uh, Bears, and then 10% Giants. Do you still play now? Do you have a way to? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I have a Nintendo. Uh, I'll play it every once in a while. Like It's it's like uh, seeing an old friend, just getting a little dance session in with an old friend. But yeah, I'll pick it up every once in a while. You still have an NES? Yeah, I have in my basement. It's incredible, and it still works. Oh, wow. So I mean, sometimes you do standard op, and you just blow on the game. But sure. um, and I don't mean one of those reissue ones where it's like small, or they come with you know sixty five games into one cartridge, and sixty two of them are ones you've never heard of. No, this right. is the actual original Nintendo, and it's not only original, Larry. It's my original. So it was in my mom's basement, wow. and I kept it from like nineteen eighty seven when I got Kung Fu and Zelda as a kid. I still have the same one. Oh wow! It's yeah. my old jalopy. Yeah, I still remember getting Zelda for Christmas. Uh, the That's the one, the gold cartridge. You make yeah, your head yeah. spin as a kid. Yeah, absolutely. Oh so, my yeah, gosh, that's that crazy. So yeah, I was more of a, I was always a Bears guy. So I guess I was just loyal to the, to the team, and uh, you know, being able to be sweetness in a football game did not suck. So incredible. And it, it, even if you were a Bears guy, it's like the team was good. It wasn't like you were beating them just out of loyalty. It was also a really loaded team. Yeah, I was all about being singletary in the on the defense, of and the field, and getting interceptions and of course and things like that. So, speaking of our beloved Chicago Bears, this is a Bears yep. show, so maybe we should talk about them a little bit. Um, sure. I would like to talk about your preseason game uh, experience at the end of the the preseason. There, you were yeah. the the play by play guy for the Bears and the Bills, which turned out to be a far more entertaining game than it started out to be. Um, oh my God! But, yeah, it was um, that was that was the that was the preseason Super Bowl of all times. So that was an incredible game. Yeah, so the Bears get out this huge lead, and, and Buffalo comes back and and uh, and wins it at the end. I think they had to score like three times in the last seven mm -hmm. minutes or something like that to uh, to win the game. But um, you know, what was it like uh, for you as a Chicago guy to be able to to call a Bears game like that? Dream, absolute dream. And I mean, it was it was really a special thing that the Bears did, that they thought to do, that they offered to me. Um, I'll give you the backstory of how it happened. For those of you Bears fans listening, what I'm talking about is last August, you'll remember that the Bears played five preseason games because they played right. the Hall of Fame game and then their traditional four. So the fifth preseason game, which was a showdown between the Buffalo Bills under A.J. McCarron and the Chicago Bears under Tyler Bray, and it came down to the last 10 seconds of the game, and the Bears lost when A.J. McCarron threw actually a really clutch touchdown pass to win in Soldier Field. Uh, so it was – that whole thing was just a blur for me. Um, I think I said it on the broadcast, something about I'm sitting up there in the booth, and I'm with uh, Jim Miller and Corey Wooten, who were just fantastic. And I'm pointing over there. I said, you know, that's – I remember that's where I was during the 1987 season when I came with my dad. That's where I was on a Monday nighter when the Bears played Michael Vick and the Falcons. Uh, that's where I was for the title game when they beat the Saints and Drew Brees. Oh, Just man. pointing all over the stadium. And the fact that here I am now in the booth on the call. And not only, Larry, I mean, listen, not only as a second or third voice to chime in and make an observation or a joke, I was driving that ship. I was 
doing the play-by-play of which I was very upfront with the Bears with. I've never done this before in my life. You know, I've watched it as much as the next guy, but that is a really difficult thing to do on a really big stage. I don't care if it's preseason or not, and I'd never done that. There's so much more that goes into it than the average football viewer might think, and I was just thankful somehow, one way or another, uh, we got the plane down. Yeah, I mean, I've I was uh, I was a broadcasting major in 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 college, and oh, cool. um, we did the we did it was a student production of the games. I went to Western Illinois, so the home games yeah. were student production, and I was in the announce booth myself and my good friend Ryan Simmons. And our claim to fame of our time in the booth is that we were the play by play and color announcers for Tony Romo's last college football game. Oh, that's awesome! Yeah, Western and how Illinois. was he? What do you remember about that? I remember being dead right about Romo that he liked to force throws when he was under pressure, um, and that uh, I nailed that one. I was the John Madden of the of the of the team, <laughs> and I said that you know I, Romo had won the the Heisman of the one AA, the Walter Payton Award, uh, that year. So he was the best that college football had to offer in one AA yeah. that year. He comes to Macomb to play my Leathernecks, and we beat him forty-eight to nine. So oh um, he had a very long day, and uh, it was the end of his uh, college career. And months later, he got signed on as an undrafted free agent to the Cowboys, and the rest, as they say, is uh, uh, history. Well, so, Larry, you were more qualified then to call that Bears Bills game <laughs> than I was. Should have been you, my friend, because man, I was in a a daze. You know, everybody, you, me, everybody listening, we've watched so many games and we've seen the Jim Nance and Al Michaels and whatnot. And they just kind of show up and do it effortlessly. You can't imagine what's going on in that booth. I had no idea. I mean, you, you stand there and there's somebody called a spotter who's next to you. Who's a person who has got binoculars and they look out on the field about here, this fullback's coming in here and here comes the kicker and they stand right next to you. At least in my experience, you know, like they're, hip was on my shoulder as I'm sitting there and they're standing and they're handing you notes constantly. And there's not obviously never anything spoken of it. Then there's like a statistician who's also, I mean, I'm telling you, they're handing you like little pieces of paper that says, you know, Bray five for five on this drive. And then you can either say it on the air or you can just ignore it or it doesn't work. There's mm-hmm. just so much going on. And we had a three man boost. You got to involve two other people and Jesus, those preseason games are hard because you show up and it's week three. All right, why? Well, there's Trubisky and there's Tariq Cohen and there's this guy. You know all the guys. But right. in week five of the preseason, no one plays. It's all guys you've never heard of. It's guys who are not going to be on the team in the matter of 24 hours, but you still got to know them. So it yeah. took a lot of research and uh, it was uh, it was really hard. But I, I, as I said, my really one goal of this is to not get the Bears in trouble and to not get my not get fired. So I didn't. Neither of those things happened. So I, I, as far as I'm concerned, I crushed it. Well, I mean, that was that was the the other thing I wanted to ask you about is because it sounded a bit uh, unorthodox as far as um, like the actual broadcast itself. Yeah. It almost sounded and and I think that like I read a press release when it was announced you were going to do the game was that the, I think that's what the Bears were going for because it was the last preseason game because it was one that you know, most fans probably wouldn't be interested in because there's a lot of guys who are playing their last football, who are not going to be on that team, going to be on different teams or out of the league at all altogether. And they wanted to present something different. And that's when they, they, they brought you in. And to, it, was, it, it, it read more or played more like, a, like talk radio with a football game going on in the background as opposed to traditional standard play-by-play with, with color guys kind of broadcast. Did you get any feedback like that about it? Yeah, I mean, Larry, you're all over it. You're obviously really well researched. It's it, how cool is this what the Bears decided to do? And it, whether you're a Bears fan or not, objectively, you can agree this is kind of a cool idea. Yeah. They said they they contacted me in the spring, and they said, "Look, we have five preseason games. Um, traditionally, the final preseason game where none of the starters play is not a big event. It's not terribly well watched. Doesn't have a lot of interest." So then that's only when we have four. Now that we have five, there might even be less. So we thought there's an opportunity here where our normal play-by-play guy, I don't mean is not available. So we thought, well, we could just find the next guy who's a classically trained broadcaster who could do the play-by-play, and I'm sure it would be fine. But given what I just set up context-wise for a, for a fifth preseason game, we thought, why not just do something different? Why not yeah. take a bit of a risk? Why not try something that might be fun? And so, you know, we watched Good Morning Football, and we thought you might be perfect for it. I was blown away. I said, you seriously, you guys want me to do the play-by-play? You know, I've never done that. You guys are the Chicago Bears. You know, this is not a Deerfield High School. Like, you are the Bears. You want me to do this? And they they laughed, and they said, 
don't think about it doing a traditional broadcast. Think about it almost like you're doing a Bears podcast while there's a game going on. If sure. two or three plays go on in a row and you don't even mention them, fine. Just talk to Jim, talk to Corey, craft conversations, and then when the game gets going on and somebody scores a touchdown, there's an interception, call it. So we kind of did that, and I, I think I executed what they wanted in that regard. It's I think it was a little jarring for people watching because – you don't, there was no setup that it was going to be that way. They, right. they didn't know who I was. There was no uh, explanation before the show came on that this will be different or parental discretion advised, anything like that. It was probably pretty jarring and maybe for some people off-putting just because it wasn't your traditional, here we go, second and 10, the ball's out to the flat, it falls incomplete, that brings on a third and long for the Bears. It wasn't a lot of that. Right. So it was so fun. And as far as all the feedback I got, I can't speak for the people watching, but the people who hired me with the Bears seem to be really pleased. Yeah, my dad was one of those people that had no idea what you were doing. He's yeah, like, sure. I mean, I saw those people. Yeah, he's like, what's the story with this play-by-play guy? And I explained to him because I had the good fortune of reading the press release, so I knew yeah. what we, what was going on going into Oh, man, going I wish more people it. had read it. Yeah, you know so what's I fun explained about to him Larry? what they was, doing. It was fun to be, um, you know, typically on Good Morning Football, you know, we're on the – the NFL's own network. We're national. We talk all 32 teams. You try to be, um, you, tr- you try to be objective as much as you can. I mean, there's certain yeah. teams you like and whatnot, but it was so fun on being on the Bears broadcast to just honk the hell out of the Bears, just homer like crazy, and just let it go. Especially in the, in the end of that game was so close. I mean, I think by the end of the game, I was saying things like, "Come on, I'm feeling an interception right here. I think McCarron's going to throw us one." And in fact, it's funny that I say us because I got the pleasure of getting to meet with um, two people. Help me, Mike Tirico, who's obviously you know iconic at this point. He's fantastic. He does every sport, yeah. um, and he told me that uh he told me he's like just just remember you're gonna have a lot of fun you're gonna have a lot of fun and i know you're gonna have comedy and everything like that but um just make sure that you remember that these are guys trying to get jobs and it's not just a complete you know throw away and you just try to keep it a little bit serious and when you can give it the due respect so that was good advice and then andrew catalan who also calls games for cbs nationally he's like just one thing he's like don't be careful of your personal pronouns. Just avoid we and us no matter what, even though it's a Bears broadcast. And I did, I think. I don't think I ever said we or us, but it felt like that by the end of the game. Because what, who am I kidding? You know, I'm from Chicago. I grew up a Bears fan. I can be objective and on TV in the morning here, but when I was in the booth and there was Soldier Field and people were getting to their feet for a week five preseason game, I felt like a Bears fan. Absolutely. And then, you know, what pers- what, what, what happened after that game not even what 24 hours later we make the trade for Khalil Mack in 2018 it it sets off into motion I mean for a guy that's that says deep into the league and its happenings and everything you know how did you think the Bears were going to do in in 2018 because I was thinking eight and eight maybe nine and seven that was even Mm -hmm. after we traded for Khalil Mack I could not account for the effect that Nagy was going to have on this yeah, and then team. they lost the opener, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, you know what's funny about that? So I do the Bears-Bills game. The preseason's over. Um, I go and I stay in my mom's house in Lake Bluff. It's very late at night. I have to get up at like 4 in the morning the next day to do good morning football, which they're allowing me to do from Hallis Hall from their remote cam where the, the players do interviews. Wow. So I go and I do the show from Hallis Hall. It's just, again, like an amazing childhood dream to be in there doing that and roaming the halls i'd never even been there before exploring and you swear there's there's ghosts there you can just feel it like the it's a really special place and then i go after the show and i go into their little cafeteria area to get um just get some breakfast like a breakfast burrito or something and i hear a, a bump on my shoulder he's like what's up man and i look up and it's coach Nagy, and i had met him once before because i did a bears charity event and I, but I didn't know him very well, but he comes over, finds me, we sit down, we talk, he tells me all these really nice things about the way I called the game last night, that his wife was saying that she was fired up and people were loving it on and on. And I'm just trying to ask him about the team. And I'm saying, you know, are you guys ready? You know, you done, you got, you got the roster set. He's like, yeah, we're almost there. And he's like, anyway, you know, he called me sometime, whatever. Great to see you. He walks away about three hours later, they traded for Khalil Mack. 
I mean, it was it was that close. I got in a, an Uber. I went downtown. I met I met my my brother for lunch, and then he's like, "Dude, are you seeing this, Khalil Mack?" And I was like, "I was just with the head coach two hours ago," and he kept such a poker face. We're actually talking about the roster and how you're looking for this year, and he's about to make I don't know the biggest trade in Bears history to get yeah. Mack, and it was so cool that it went down. And being downtown in Chicago when that happened. It was just shockwaves. And then I went to the airport. And there's people in the airport looking at their phones and freaking out. It was almost like a holiday. It really was. And, um, you know, I was excited at that point because to answer your original question, Larry, about what did I think the Bears season was going to be like, I actually was on record as being really, really high on them because, one, I just believe in the thing in the NFL every year, every single year. You can look it up. A team goes from last place in the division of first. It always yeah. happens. And when you say it's going to happen in the off season, you sound like an idiot. Like if you were to look around the NFC or AFC right now and say, well, you know, I think I think the Niners can shock some people this year or whoever it may be. I think the Bengals could win. You sound stupid, but watch, it'll happen. So I actually thought the Bears did have a shot because I believed in the new coach and I had just seen what McVay had done with the Rams. You know, and I had just seen that over and over. And I thought if we can get any of that and we get anything at all out of Trubisky, I think this team is really good on defense, especially. And then sure enough, they win the North. So I'd love to say I was surprised, but I wasn't shocked. Yeah, I, I thought that we were a year away. I, I've, I've said yeah. all along, even before the Mac trade, that I thought 2019 was going to uh-huh. be the year. It's going to be year two in the offense, year two with all of these new moving parts on offense playing together. They have an offseason together. I, you know, to, to go on top of what we already had on defense, then we add Khalil Mack to that and everything. I thought all along 2019 was the year. And honestly, I still believe that. I do believe that 2019 is the year that the Bears really make some moves as opposed to just being that that team that came from out of nowhere. I know. I hear you. And I mean, I, listen, the, the, there's been, you know, Bob's and Weaves this offseason. They've lost a couple guys. They've added a couple guys. I still think they're intact. I love Chuck Pagano. I, I, I love Maggie. Um, I don't see any reason why they shouldn't be gangbusters next year, too. I really don't. I mean, the the division will be good. It'll be really good. It's a, you can't. It's like they finally had this thing last year where I would always harp on. I can't really give the Bears any respect nationally until they take care of their own business, and they got to beat Rodgers. I mean, they got to beat them. It's, yeah. it's. I don't know. As growing up a Bears fan into my adolescence and my adulthood, it was always this curse where it felt like they could never beat Favre, and Favre right. would kill them. And he was just he would rip their heart out every time they played. And that's, I remember thinking at one point, you know, we got we, we got to have Favre retire so just we can bring somebody in here we can actually beat. And then the guy who comes in after Favre is even better than Favre. So it's yes. like, are we going to be in for 25 years of losing to him? So that's why you start last year, you bring in Mac, he hulks out like a wild man in the first game, and mm-hmm. Rodgers returns from the dead and still beats them. So I said, I don't know, I don't believe in curses or any of that nonsense, but. They can't beat Rodgers. I mean, he absolutely – and then so the fact that they did it at the end of the season and they were in Soldier Field and they beat him, uh, it was just it – it, it was like a huge weight off the shoulders of the whole team. And yet, I know he's going to be back. I know he's going to be great next year. And the the Packers, I think, got better in the offseason. So, listen, it's not going to be any picnic in the NFC North. I think all three teams and then maybe the Lions will come to play too. But I don't see why they shouldn't be able to win at the Bears. Right. Well, Kyle, I know that you uh, you have to run, so I got a few more quick questions for what you. What do you got, Larry? We'll, Give it to we'll me. We'll let you go. Um, number one, if you could pick the Super Bowl halftime show, you know, we had Lady Gaga, you know, all sure. those people. Who would who would Kyle Brandt put on the stage? I've proposed this to the person who actually goes in and selecting it, oh, and nice. I want something that's really, really, really different, and it's going to get a lot of reaction online, positive, negative, otherwise. I would love one year – if the NFL said, screw it, instead of music for halftime, we're going to do stand-up comedy. And you pick two guys, two guys who do a six-minute set each. And I think if you did, you got to do universal people who people all across the country know, really all across the world. I would love to see uh, Jerry Seinfeld do six minutes and then Chris Rock do six minutes, one after another. And I don't think it will ever happen. But can you imagine – the social media reaction to their content, to their jokes, to their topics, uh, if it's really good, or can you imagine the social media reaction if it's really bad? Who was better? I think it's incredible. I mean, I could give you a million pop acts, and I could say Foo Fighters should do it, and they'd be great. I want a stand-up comic double bill for the Super Bowl halftime. Wow. That was... Yeah, I didn't see that one coming. Um, no, no one does. And then yeah. they bring up, oh, that might actually be cool, but I don't think it'll ever happen. 
<laughs> so, so you 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 grew up in the Chicago area. You yeah. lived in New York and L.A. Which uh, yeah. which do you prefer? Well, I still have that thing where I'm 40 now, and I haven't lived in Chicago since I was 18. But right. I still refer to Chicago as home. Right. I say, you know, like if if my wife and I and my kids, uh, if we book a flight to go see family in Chicago, I'll still say like we're flying home which is nuts, but it says everything. You know, if you set me down, whether in the city or up north, and just you give me a, a local WGN broadcast and a Giordano's deep dish pizza, I'm in heaven. Giordano's. I'm a Lou Malnati's guy. You like Lou? I, I respect it. I'm just not on my team. I, I, I don't the, – the cornmeal crust, the chunky tomatoes on the top, it's not my thing. I live mm-hmm. and die with Giordano's. It would be my death row meal if I was to be executed. But I have plenty of friends who like Lou's too, and I respect it. Well, you just lost my dad, so that's uh, – Oh, that's sure. wow. Well, Giordano, dad's, uh, that's all, all day. Dad's uh, ride or die with Lou Malnati's. So. <laughs> um, who's uh, your favorite bear? Sweetness does not count. So we'll, we'll, uh, he's obviously all number time? one on everybody's all time. Who's the favorite bear? Oh man, I think that's a great question. If you take sweetness out, um, yeah. Listen, you can. I, I can name any. Uh, so many people on the '85 team. I always, when I was a kid, I loved Matt Suey. I okay. loved him because it was almost like he was Sweetness's bodyguard, and he had a mustache and he had a vertical face mask bar. Yeah. And then I remember years later, I remember, like, I remember when like the Yankees had Hideki Matt Suey. I was like, Hey, Hideki Matt Suey. <laughs> I was just a fr- nobody ever talked about that. But I'm like, oh, Matt Suey's already been done. That was in the '85 Bears. So right. I loved him. Um, I'm trying to think of somebody non '85. My favorite Bears team, I'll work that way. Uh, I, I, every, of course, everybody loves 85 as well. But my favorite Bears team was the 2001 Bears team. Um, okay. The 13-3, sure. and three, Jim Miller, young, young Erlacher, uh, the A-train at running back, David Terrell, Mike Brown. That was my favorite team because they was just so out of nowhere. And yeah. uh, it was so many personalities. And Dick Duran, not one of those personalities, but respected. Um, right. And yet, despite them being my favorite team, uh, my favorite bear of all time is a guy who I think should be in the Hall of Fame who's going to have a lot of trouble getting in, and that's Devin Hester. That's the mm-hmm. guy. Um, yeah. I mean, I remember watching him at Miami. I remember his very first game as a pro against Green Bay when he housed one. I was at the game in Arizona. The Bears let him off the hook game oh, wow. when he did the one at the end of the game. And um, obviously, I, I mean, I was having a Super Bowl party in my house for Bears-Colts. And I remember when Vinatieri kicks it off, and I'm like, oh, my God, they kicked to Hester. And then 30 seconds later, he was in the end zone, and I was running around my front yard, like, spraying champagne from a bottle that I was supposed to save for the end of the game. It was one of the most exciting – I think it was the most exciting sports spectator moment of my life was the opening kickoff of that Super Bowl down in Miami. So it's Devin Hester. Um, He's the best to ever do it. I loved him. Every single second was just magic with him. Well, that's the bittersweet thing about that Super Bowl is that, yeah, the Bears lost it, but they have the moment from that game that everyone will always remember. So, I mean, mean, people – It's it's frustrating as hell because you're going against this Peyton Manning passing offense, and the gods shine down upon you and say that on this particular day it's going to be raining – which would yeah. already be in favor of, uh, I would think, of the Bears that year. So that's that's it never rains in the Super Bowl. So you got that. The opening kickoff is returned for a touchdown, which immediately jacks your win probability way up. There's that great shot on the sideline. I believe it's Thomas Jones who's mic'd up, who runs over to Rex Grossman and says, you know what this means? After Hester returns the kick, he says, you know what this means, right? We're going to get the ball with great field position every time now because they won't kick to him anymore. And right. he was right. On the top of that, Peyton Manning comes out in his first drive – he misses Dallas Clark, who runs the wrong route, and then he throws an interception. So it's like everything is going perfectly. How this mm-hmm. is, You could not have a better start. This is a biblically great bear start. And then they still win the game. And they, win, they, or they still lose the game, and they lose by double digits. It wasn't even that climactic at the end. And Adam Vinatieri, yeah. young Adam Vinatieri, missed an extra point in that game for the Colts. <laughs> and it still didn't matter. I mean, there were so many things that went their way. And yet I get frustrated because I still remember Bob Sanders just unloading on Cedric Benson at the goal line and him fumbling. So that was a huge mistake. And it is a frustrating thing that the Bears were in the Super Bowl. It was so cool. But I just feel like they, the Colts didn't get the Bears' best shot that day. Yeah. And two more things. Uh, one, so you, you, you've you already said you, you saw you Hester live in, in Arizona. You were at the NFC Championship yep. game. So what would be your favorite moment as a Bear fan? you know, either, either growing up or, you know, as you've been so much closer to it all uh, in the industry lately? 
Um, you know, I, certainly I could say I've gotten to meet a lot of the Bears, you know, a bunch of times, which has been very cool, and guys who I loved, and, you know, people I grew up idolizing, like uh, Singletary and Richard Dent and people like that. Um, you know, that, that title game against the Saints, I think it was it for me. I, I, I could say when I was six years old and I remember watching Super Bowl twenty and my birthday is right then, so we're having my birthday party. And when I thought the fridge scored and the fridge was the coolest thing for a six-year-old, I thought that was fun. But um, yeah. that Bears Saints game in, in Soldier Field was absolutely incredible. I think I was about 27 at the time. And if anybody listening has never been to a title game, I've gotten the privilege of going to a few Super Bowls. Um, over the last few years, but when you win the title game and it's, you you realize we're going to the Super Bowl, yeah. that's a really special thing. And I just remember walking around the columns and all around the stadium after that game, and people were just screaming that, like, we're going to the Super Bowl, we're going to the Super Bowl. And it had been, you know, 21 years since then. Um, so I think that was it. And that game was wild, and it was Reggie Bush and Drew Brees and um, – Grossman was really bad, but they made enough plays and they got it done. So, and it snowed at the end. Um, yeah. It was magical, and just being around and like one of those hugging strangers types atmospheres. Um, right. That was it. The the Bears Saints NFC title game. That was the one for me. Yeah, I was I was downtown Chicago for the game and yeah. uh, watching the game with some friends and walking the streets afterwards and people honking their horns and you're high fiving random strangers, sticking their hands out of their car windows yeah. and stuff like that. It was. It was crazy to uh, to be in in the t- in the city when all that was uh, happening. So um, I actually had the good fortune. Uh, I didn't get to go to Soldier Field much. I actually have never been there since they rebuilt it. But oh, yeah. I was in October of '84, the day that Walter Payton broke Jim Brown's rushing record. Mm-hmm. That's my little uh, claim to. Oh, you uh, were there. I was there. I was six oh, years that's old, so cool. and I don't remember the actual moment. I actually remember everything else about that day. I don't remember him breaking the record and the commotion that followed. I remember yeah. everything else. It was raining outside. It was the Saints. It was, you know, uh, I think our seats were on the five yard line and he scored a touchdown with his over the top uh, routine, uh, yeah. diving over the pile and everything. So I, I, I do remember being there. Well, you were day. a little kid. You probably remember, you know, the peanuts and root yeah. beer you had. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember my dad teaching me how to eat a hot dog under a poncho while it was raining outside. I remember. Oh, that's that. classic. That's, you got to know that yes. stuff. <laughs> and then f- finally, and, and Kyle, yeah. this will determine whether or not I will ever ask you to be on the show again. All right, here you're we go. Chicago, you're a Chicago area guy. Yes. Cubs or White Sox? Cubs or White Sox? Mm-hmm. I mean, this is I, I'm the guy who grew up with the Ryan Sandberg poster on my wall, okay. the boys of Zimmer. Uh, I could go on and on. I was a big Mark Grace guy. I lived and died with Kerry Wood and Mark Pryor. Listen, I respect Frank Thomas, Carlton Fisk, Dan Pasqua, Steve Lyons, all those guys as much as the next person. The officer, Ron Karkovice, I liked it. But if you're going to ask me, I'm going to go with the North Siders, my friend. Guess who's coming back on the show at some point, ladies hey, and gentlemen? Cubs win! <laughs> Cubs Cubs win. win! Born and raised oh, on the awesome, north man. side, dude. I literally lived minutes away from Wrigley Field down Clark Street. So I, I is that right? I am, yep. Blue, white, and red oh, my whole life, bro. So I'm I'm all in on the Cubs. So I, I was, cried uh, like a baby when they won yeah. the pennant when they beat Did the you? Dodgers. I was a blubbering, so emotional and so uh, you know crying so hard. My dog, may he rest in peace felt the need to comfort me while I was crying after the the the, the Cubs got oh that double gosh. play to win the pennant. That's how, yeah, to Rizzo how push heavy the ball in his pocket. I, you know, it yeah, it was, re- it was unbelievable. So, but oh, Kyle, man. thanks so much uh, for coming, man. This has been great. I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to, uh, to come on my little show. And uh, I look forward to having you on again real soon. I'm flattered to be asked, Larry. You run a great show here. The questions were fantastic. You, this is effortless. I, uh, I appreciate all the research you went into this, and thank you so much for the support, man. I genuinely mean that. Thank you very much for having me. Kyle Brandt, good football or good morning football. The Kyle Brandt experience. When is that show on, Kyle? It's only on in the fall. So we did 16 episodes in the fall, and we'll start back okay. up again in uh, in September. I'm going to try to get Trubisky on. And that one's a little bit different, right? What, what, uh, what, what? Oh, it's wild, man. Anybody listening who remembers the old George Michael sports machine from the late 80s, early 90s, it's kind of like that. It's just me mashing buttons, playing highlights, uh, bringing people in. It's really, really fun, and it's got a lot of nostalgia to it. Um, So you'll love it. It'll be back, uh, God willing, uh, in September. Awesome. 
Awesome. Kyle, thanks so much uh, for, for being on the show, man. I really appreciate it. Larry, bear down. Bear down. So there you have it, guys. Kyle Brandt from the NFL Network. Good morning football, the Kyle Brandt experience. An overall great guy, man. I had a really, really nice time, a really great time talking to him. Kyle was a lot of fun. Uh, it was a great sport talking about his days of our lives, uh, days and uh, the, 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 the journey to get from uh, an English degree in Princeton all the way to the NFL network and, and being a part of one of the one of the best uh, one of the probably the best football show on on television uh, uh, right now. It's uh, definitely not a, a, a an orthodox path to get where he from where he started to get where he is. You know, like you heard me talk about it in the conversation It's like it's not that big a leap. His last job before the NFL network was. Uh, radio and TV with with as part of the the Jim Rome show. Not a big leap to go from there to there, but <laughs> a monumental leap to go from Days of Our Lives to Jim Rome. It's just like how do you pivot into that? It's just it, that that's the part that I had to know when I was uh, checking out his uh, his resume on, on Wikipedia. Uh, you know, last night as I was getting prepared, but had a great time talking to him. Hope to have him on again uh, real soon, man. He was uh, he was a lot of fun. So. And uh, after I got done talking to him, of course, I had a, a whole page of notes and things that I didn't get a chance to talk to him uh, about. But that just means we'll save more fun for next time. So uh, anyway, um, I do have a little a couple of things to talk about uh, bear related, but um, I'm going to save my thoughts, uh, evaluations, analysis, if you will, on the free agent signings that the Bears have made in the first uh, 10 days or so. Uh, not even 10 days. I mean, I guess you can call it 10 days if you're including the the quote-unquote tampering uh, period. But, um, you know, the, the some of the signings, uh, they've been interesting. Uh, we did lose both Callahan and Amos. Uh, we didn't get to keep either of them. Uh, we're still waiting to replace Amos we haven't signed a safety yet but we have signed a nickel corner that's supposed to be our heir apparent to uh, Bryce Callahan I'll talk about all that next week on the free agency review I want to give the Bears another week or so to, uh, to 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 go through especially because there are still a lot of big names out there right now looking for future NFL homes so I don't want to uh, to uh, to spoil anything or, or to you know kind of give a grade on what the Bears have done and they're not done doing it yet and I know they won't be fully done until training camp starts or maybe even after that but for the most part the bulk of what you're going to do in the offseason is done in the first two weeks they've only had one so I want to give them another one before I uh, do that and quite frankly guys we're already in the latter half uh, of March we're probably less than a month away from the 2019 schedule being released so we got that conversation to have um, looking to get back in touch with our good friend scott wright from draftcountdown.com to do some draft uh, preview should be interesting this year since our first pick is until like 87 uh this year as opposed to being eighth overall uh a year ago so i wonder what kind of talk we can have uh about the bears and and their draft prospects um if we're not picking till late in the third round uh, this year because of the Khalil Mack and Anthony Miller trades but uh, we'll see if we can get him on and uh, see who else I can dig up you know I got Emory Moorhead and Kyle Brandt uh, maybe I can dig up someone else uh, as well maybe maybe shake the trees with my new friends Emory Moorhead and Kyle Brandt to see uh, who maybe they could get me in touch with and uh, see who I can work my magic on to talk them into being a guest on our podcast so um, yeah it's it's been a it's been a lot of fun. I've uh, I've really enjoyed uh, talking to Emery, talking to uh, to Kyle. It's it's uh, it's been a blast. So um, anyway, let's uh, dig through the muck here. And there was something that I wanted to talk about. And now that I'm kind of in my euphoria over how awesome the Kyle Brandt conversation went, I'm uh, <laughs> I forgot what it was. But uh, let's take a look here. Okay. I found it, and it's actually just one thing that I wanted to talk about, and it was, um, 
I saw a, a report, uh, an article, a column, something like that uh, earlier this week saying that um, analytics show that the Raiders were the big winner, winner of the Khalil Mack trade. And I will concede that this is a possibility about five years from now that you could say, looking back at it all, the Raiders won that trade because of everything they got from the Bears. The picks that they made worked out. They were all pro bowlers that played a key part in the success that now is the Oakland, or as we probably will be saying five years from now, the Las Vegas uh, Raiders. But I don't know how anyone who can look at that trade from where we sit right now less than a year, not even six months really, just barely six and a half months ago when that trade was made, how you can say anybody but the Bears won that trade because the Raiders were worse. They were they were 6-10 and 10 the year before. They were 4-12 and 12 last season without Khalil Mack. They had 13 sacks as a team last year without Khalil Mack. Khalil Mack had 12 and a half by himself for the Bears. The Bears went from 5-11 and 11 to 12-4, and 4, won the division title, went to the playoffs. John Gruden's team seemed to spiral into the further and further into the mud as the, the season went along. And uh, I don't know how anyone could say at this point in this time how anybody but the Bears are winning that trade right now, are winning the trade, not did win, are winning. They are winning right now. We know that, that we'll never really be able to settle this until we're years removed from it to see who the players ended up being that the Raiders used those picks on, how those players ended up working out for the Raiders, and so on and so forth. So I just thought it was it was weird that somehow there's an analytic algorithm or something like that out there that says anybody but the Bears is winning that trade right now. So, I mean, because you, you take it all into effect. Khalil Mack and his impact with Chicago on the field, outstanding. The negative of it, the draft capital that we lost to get him, and the huge chunk of salary cap space that he is taking up so that we can keep him, you know, averaging $23 million a season for the next six years, that's going to play a big part in how the Bears, you know, shape and mold their football team going forward. Not to mention, we've got guys that need to get paid in the next few years, like Eddie Jackson, Tariq Cohen, Mitch Trubisky, possibly uh, Leonard Floyd, and so on. So, I mean, it's... uh, it's definitely it definitely could have ill effects as we move further down the line as far as salary cap and, and how we keep this team together for the long term. But right here, right now, the Bears saw a seven game improvement. Their defense went from being pretty good to special overnight with the addition of Khalil Mack. So I don't see how I mean, and I read the article. It didn't say anything about how it's projecting that the Raiders were winning the trade. They're saying that it was the best offseason move and that the Raiders were the winners. I can't wrap my head around that. I really can't, especially since everything that was coming out of Oakland was saying that the Raiders made the trade with Chicago because they believed Chicago to be the weakest of the franchises that they were dealing with. Therefore, they would get the best draft picks out of Chicago. And instead, they're getting 24 overall in the first round and I think 20, 24 overall or something like that in the third round uh, this year because it was a first and a third this year and a first and a sixth or something like that next year, something like that. No, the third, third, third round pick is next season, not this year because we uh, basically we traded, we gave them our third for 2020, but we got their second. So we got two second round picks, but no third round pick next year as part of the uh, deal so I think it was a first and a sixth round pick this year and then the Bears get a two and a five next year out of uh, out of the rate so I mean we still got a second round pick and a fifth round pick for Khalil Mack uh, and Khalil Mack I should say see how those guys end up impacting the team I mean it's there's a lot to take in so that's why I was kind of baffled over the fact that it was saying that the Raiders are the winners now the Raiders are the winners now, not that they project to be the winners because, A, they got two first-round picks out of it. They got a third-round pick out of it. They got salary cap space to make the moves that they've made this offseason and going to get like Antonio Brown and, and all those other guys uh, and everything. They've got the salary cap space to do whatever uh, and so on. But 
I get that. If they said five years from now it'll the Raiders are going to be the winners, I could see how that could be possible five years down the road and the implication that Khalil Mack's salary could have on our salary cap situation and how it could hamstring the Bears as, as to making moves and trying to keep this nucleus together in, in the future and, and so on, I can see that. But they're saying that the, it was the best offseason move and the Raiders were the winners of the trade right now. That's, I don't see that. I just don't see it at all. So um, anyway, that's really all I have for now. Like I said, I want to save the rest for the free, free agency preview, which would be sometime uh, next week possibly midweek wednesday thursday uh somewhere around there want to give two full weeks uh of uh transactions and free agency time uh free agency started last week on the 13th say next week 27th 28th something like that uh so two full weeks so maybe friday at the latest i'm giving myself some uh, a wide berth here on this one but to see uh what else the bears might be able to put together especially since you know, they made some moves to clear up salary cap space. Speaking of Khalil Mack, they turned his, uh, I think it was his roster bonus into a signing bonus or something. I forget how they played with the money, but it gave the Bears $11 million in cap space for this year. So I think even after re-signing Pat O'Donnell yesterday, it still gives them somewhere north of $15 million in cap space left. So they've got some mo- money to make some moves, and there are some big names out there some guys that can help us that uh would be interesting to see if a week or so from now the bears might have been able to strike a deal uh with one of those guys so we'll see how the rest of it goes but uh keep your eyes peeled on twitter at btu underscore larry or on the facebook page just search bears talk underground and you'll find me and uh you know keep in communication i love talking with you guys you guys have been asking me uh questions to get my ideas and thoughts on things and i appreciate that it's a lot of fun so uh please keep doing that whether it be on twitter or on the facebook page and uh keep your eyes peeled for when the next show uh is coming out so uh that's it for now this was the kyle brandt show i had a great time talking to him look forward to talking to him again and i look forward to seeing you guys again next week when we review the bears and all their transactions and free agency And until then, my name is Larry D, and this has been the Bears Talk Underground.